All right, please welcome the producer and the star of the film, Mark Feuerstein. What's up, everybody? All right, let's talk some Larry Gay. Okay. So you star in it and produced it. Yes. Talk to me about the producing process. I mean, how did this come across your desk and how did you pitch people to make it? Great question, Caitlin. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, so, my buddy Mike Sykowitz, who was a writer for the TV show Friends, uh, along with my wife, who wrote for the TV show Friends years ago, he gave me this script. And maybe it was on Steve Carell and Will Ferrell's desk at one time, but they weren't making Larry Gay, Renegade, Male Flight Attendant. And I wasn't going to either until I started doing Royal Pains and felt like, hey, maybe I could uh, make something happen here. So I started by... Uh, asking my buddy Sam Friedlander if he would direct it, asking my buddy Michael Royf if he would produce it. Then I went to actors who would help raise the money. So I got Stanley Tucci, Marcia Gay Harden, Molly Shannon, Tay Diggs, and Henry Winkler first. Each of them was its own. No big deal, by it the was way. A, it was a pain in the dust. No tux. big deal. The cast on this film is it's just a veritable like sort of who's who in Hollywood. You have an incredible cast. Thank I mean, you. Rebecca Romain. Yep. You, like you said, Molly Shannon, Tate Diggs, Stanley Tucci, Janet yep. Mays, Danny Pudi. You had this incredible cast of people. That is not an easy task for a casting director on any kind of film, but you're taking this on as a producer. Uh, for fledgling filmmakers out there, it was kind of a snowball effect. I mean... To get the first few, it took some doing. Stanley Tucci is a busy guy. I know him from a TV show we did years ago on CBS called Three Pounds. No one ever saw it, so you wouldn't know it. It was on for a full three episodes and gone. But I loved him, and he was very kind to me. But he wasn't exactly reading the script right away, so uh, I went to... I was going to go to Balducci's to get Italian meats and send it to him, but my... My friend Johnny, who takes me to work, to, who drives, says, uh, you're not going to Balducci's, you're going to Russo's in Brooklyn. So we went to Russo's in Brooklyn, where he picked up a box of prosciutto, capicol, mortadelle, mozzarella, all things that end in E-L-L, and uh, drove it to South Salem, New York, and dropped it at Stanley's door, where they then chatted, because Stanley was home for like... 20 minutes about Teamster stuff and Nora Ephron, who they'd both, both worked with. And then Stanley wrote me, called me and left me a message saying, hey, Mark, I'm going to do it, but not because of your fucking prosciutto, but because I love you, which is very nice. And I was thrilled because I had a great actor and a great name with which to go then raise the money, which I did by having many awkward conversations with lots of strangers who had money. And eventually I raised the budget and uh, we were able to make our movie. I have to say, if you showed up at probably any one of our doors with a box of prosciutto and mozzarella, we probably all would do whatever you asked solely for the prosciutto. A show of and, hands. And a show of hands. Right, like a if I showed up at your door with go. prosciutto, like you'd do what I asked you to do. Something. See, I got there we go. Two, I got three, four. Ooh, I got, yeah, got so right, many I got people. about a half. I got right. about a half. Dog, okay. The dog raised his hand. <laughs> dog raised. Right. I mean, obviously, if you showed up with prosciutto, the dog is going to be that's right there. That's a good point. That's, that's a good a, point. That's a good tactic to employ. Yeah. Because no one's going to say, yeah, I did it for the meat, but... But they will do but it for the But you got meat. Stanley Tucci in. And we started to see a little bit of that amazing scene that you have with him. And I'd love to actually take a look at that clip so we can roll that scene with Stanley Tucci. How many takes did it take to get through that scene without laughing? Um, we were having a great time. We were having a great time. Um, Stanley is so amazing. He's so so funny, his facial expressions, and even his delivery on that line, well, you're fired, you know? I mean, it's just so unconventional, the way he finds, uh, you know, to, ex to say a line. And, uh, and even then, we were, we were doing that scene a, a bunch of takes. Stanley even, like, gave me a little advice at one point, something about when I put my hands on the table and freeze. He was just so, such a good guy. And I, I remember that day he was, he, he was doing Jimmy Kimmel. So he was rushing to shoot our scene and then go to the Jimmy Kimmel show where he was a guest. Uh, so we had to get him out at a certain time. But those are the kind of things you deal with when you're making a low budget movie. Now to be Larry Gay, you had to be sort of silly. Yes. Um, not just funny, but silly. How did you get comfortable with 
um, saying the dumb thing, saying the thing that made everybody's eye roll as the character and being um, ridiculous. I mean, I found some line between enormous and playing certain lines very straight because like when April, my love interest says, uh, we're, I'm about, I'm packing a suitcase on the bed and she says, do you have to go? And I say, no, I went this morning. And you can't do that any other way but just playing it for real. Um, but then there were scenes that required a lot more energy and I think it was finding that balance between playing the, the naturalness of the situation and making it funny and, and playing the high comic value of the movie. Uh, but it was always you know, particular to who I was working with. So the energy between me and Jason Alexander was different than the energy between me and Stanley Tucci or that with Henry Winkler or Danny Pudi. I'm very, I'm like a tennis, like when you play tennis, you're sometimes only as good as the, <laughs> Do I, look like I don't I've know why I'm telling tennis? you about that, but you know, no. maybe you've played once in your life. I'm not very coordinated. Right, I, get I get it, I get the Has back anybody, and forth other of people tennis. Play te Nobody plays sometimes tennis. you're only as good as the person you're playing with and um, that's, I'm very susceptible to that. So. Uh, I was I was very much uh, a, a sort of uh, I was I was playing with what I was being played with. What was your end game when you set out to make this film? Did you have something in mind of what you want it to be? Because there's a website, flicksided.com. Um, it's sort of a subsection of a larger film website. Dubbed the movie a cult classic. That's I, a High compliment for a comedy. I'm a huge devotee of flicksided.com as of right now. Um, what did I set out to do? I set out to make a movie like the ones that I loved growing up, like the movie Airplane. And I know that Sam Friedlander, our director, would echo that sentiment. Um, I set out to make a, a studio comedy for a not studio budget and to see if we could actually get it out into the world in the proper way. Um, so on some level we have accomplished at least a part of the dream here which is to make a movie and to get it out into the world. I mean it's been playing in some theaters across the country, not a ton but some, and it's on demand. Uh, where any person in this country and many parts of the world could watch it. That's a dream come true for me because it's hard to do anything, let alone make a movie that actually gets released. And it's funny, with certain films that are dubbed sort of cult classics, when they come out, they come out as smaller films for the most part. I mean, what were you looking at in regards to a script? Because I feel like watching the movie and sort of re-watching it again, it's the kind of movie that each time you watch it, it gets funnier and funnier and you hear little things and you he you catch these tiny little one-liners as opposed to other kinds of films where you, you know, you're sort of, you're laughing at the onset, but you watch it again and you know what's going on. So you remember how funny it was, but it doesn't continue to be funny. This gets funnier the more times you watch it and you catch little things. Well, first of all, I love you, Caitlin Becker. I know that. Um, and secondly, if it became a cult classic in any way, we would be over the moon. We have no control over that. But at the end of the day, you read a script and it just made, it, I was laughing hysterically on my couch and I thought this is something worth putting my time into. And as ridiculous as it sounds, this was my Rocky. I mean, this was my, like I, that was my favorite movie as a kid. And I put everything I had into this. It took a lot of work. Um, and look, I dream of doing everything from romantic comedies to dramatic material. I've been lucky enough to do that. But I found a script I loved and I, I put my heart into it. Let's talk actual Larry Gay, renegade male flight attender. How many of you guys have been on terrible flights? I mean, I know I have, right? See, you have in the polo. You're 11, you've already been on terrible flights. How did you get in the mind of a flight attendant? So I accosted every flight attendant that I flew with um, over the last like two years. I've taken pictures with over 30 flight attendants and asked them what they love about flying and what they hate about flying. And 
you know, the answers are similar. Sometimes they love the flexibility and the, which is sort of, you know, our, our movie romanticizes the, the life of a flight attendant on some level, I guess. Um, Larry is living the dream, flying to crazy places. Uh, but they also hate, you know, passengers who are demanding. Uh, even Jenny McCarthy told a story when I was doing serious radio about how she asked the flight attendant to put her bag up there. They wouldn't, then they did three other people and she took pictures of, uh, of those flight attendants and then learned that it was illegal to post pictures of flight attendants, which I promptly did. Not only uh, 40 did you, but you, you probably posted 40 photos with a hashtag real renegades. So people could actually like follow the trail of all the illegal photos that you Correct. put up Correct. on social I, media. I like to present an organized dossier to the cops when they're going to arrest me. So from what you learned from real flight attendants, what did you bring from those things to Larry Gate? Because when I tell you, if we've had a bad flight, as you go through, sort of Larry Gay deals with every terrible thing that could possibly happen on a flight ever. Listen, Larry Gay has won six golden coffee pots. Um, that's a big deal, okay? He's, he's the best at what he does. So it was really not as much about... Uh, hearing from a flight attendant how she likes to pour a nice cup of coffee, but knowing that in everything that Larry was gonna do, I would do it with the utmost excellence. So when I'm pulling the tray out and putting the tray back in and I'm pouring the coffee and putting my tie in my shirt, to me this was as important as it gets. So I took it, you know, I felt like he was a guy who takes himself too seriously and went with that. You really speak about it with a lot of fervor. Thank you so much. I think, do you think you could do the job? I think I'd be unbelievable. I was a horrible waiter though, I should the, have you know. I feel like but that I, has I, to match up somehow. I am a very patient person. I think I would be a great flight attendant. Have yeah. you ever had a, a, like a horror flight? What's the worst flight you've ever had? Um, with my daughter, Lila, we were flying uh, from LA to New York. She threw up all over me. I took my shirt off, and then I wore that horrendous little wool slash poly blend blanket over myself with my shirt off for five hours of that flight. Not a great look, and not a great smell, and not a great flight. What did the flight attendants do? Uh, they asked if I could spend most of the flight in the bathroom. But I couldn't because I had to take care of my daughter. My wife was ensconced in a nice nap in the corner. Oh, lucky. No, she wasn't. She knew what was happening. She did open up one eye and was like, oh, yes. hell no. Correct. She was mortified. She is a smart, smart woman. That's exactly what I would have done. Good to know. Okay. I if, won't bring you on my next flight with my children. If they're not sick, that's fine. I don't think I can handle that. Speaking of flights, Mile High Club. No, not a member. But is anyone here a member and would uh, they actually like oh, to share on, it here at the it. Apple Store? It's impressive. Come Those on. bathrooms yeah, are I saw tiny. one hand almost go up. Sort of half a hand I, back there. Yep. Yep. One well member. Well done. One member it's of the not, it, I imagine it is tricky. Uh, as, as, uh, as, 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 as we Larry. evidence in the documentary that is Larry Gay, renegade male flight attendant, we see me trying to uh, have sexual activity in a lavatory. And it proves difficult. Where do you go? I don't even know why I asked that question because now I just, it's, it's only downhill after, after that. I have a quiz question for our audience. Airline terminology, flight attendant terminology, crotch rot. No, crotch watch, sorry, <laughs> that's something else. Crotch rot. That's something I, I had in imagine. college. Um, <laughs> crotch watch. Crotch watch. Do you think it is A, when a flight attendant is checking out the packages of various uh, male patrons of their airline, <laughs> or do you think it's that they're checking to see if they've put their seatbelts on? A, packages, B, seatbelts. Raise your hand for A, packages. But it is actually seatbelts. But it's actually B, seatbelt. Actually Yeah, seat so belts. the other people who voted, I didn't get to ask who voted B because you gave the answer away before I could. They, they shouted it out, she got it right. She did, all right. She got it right. You didn't have to answer yet. I'm okay. sorry, I got excited. Well done, well done, good job. You guys didn't know you were gonna show up and get quizzed. Another Tell fun term, uh, term is 
uh, Coach Roach. See, I confused them before. Crotch Roach would be another thing that I probably had in college. <laughs> but Coach Roach is a flight attendant who doesn't like to fly first class or business. Too good for them. They hang out in coach. That's a Coach Roach. Okay. I, don't know, I think that might be what I'd want to do. I feel like the first class passengers are needy. You're right? probably right, but there's only eight of them as opposed to the 40 or 50 in coach. Very true, very true. Let's talk about acting. Okay. How old were you when you knew this was what you wanted to do? Uh, I was about 20. Really? Uh-huh. I, I was a jock, uh, extracurricular kind of guy in high school, involved in student politics. I was not shy, but I was not an actor. And then I got to college and I was playing football and I was doing all these extracurricular activities that I wasn't that passionate about. Um, and I just auditioned for a play on the way to football practice. I wandered into the theater on team, the student theater, and I auditioned for a play called Burn This, uh, a very excellent play by Lanford Wilson. And it was the, origin, the part that I was auditioning for was originally played by John Malkovich, a very artistic, uh, sort of modern Mozart, but because he cursed a little bit in the speech that I was delivering for the audition, my conclusion was, this is Andrew Dice Clay. <laughs> so the Everyone speech he's giving- too young for Andrew Dice. Nobody even reacted. Fine. Well, you'll Suffice get it. Suffice it to say he has a potty mouth. He has a potty mouth. And uh, the, the speech went something like, it was a letter that the character was reading, Dear Pale. Uh, it was about from the roommate, the gay roommate, who uh, had feelings for, the, for my character. Dear Pale, I can't take living with you. It's unmanageable being here anymore. When you're done reading, burn this, right? So because of certain dialogue, I felt this was Andrew Dice Clay. So I come into this audition for this very tight Connecticut girl director, and I do Andrew Dice Clay. So I'm like, dear Pale, I can't take it anymore. Living with you is unmanageable. When you're done reading, burn this. Oh! <laughs> Booyah! This director is staring at me like, who the, get out. Get out, no, goodbye. But the assistant director was watching and he directed the next play, which is a play called Orphans by Lyle Kessler and I got that play and it was about two brothers. It was very personal to me who, I have a brother and a, and a father figure. Uh, there was a movie once, um, with Kevin Anderson and Albert Finney and Matthew Modine. Anyway, it was, it's a beautiful play and it kind of changed my life. And uh, the people I did it with, I, I found them, the, the experience of being on stage and making people laugh and making people cry and uh, the high of being on stage, I was just, I, I caught the bug and I was addicted for life to this thing that I do. What were you majoring in? I was thinking I would be uh, a, a political science guy. I was gonna go into the Woodrow Wilson School of International Relations and maybe go to law school and be a lawyer like my father and my brother, but a funny thing happened on the way to football practice. So what did your parents say? When, where, you went to Princeton, was it? I went to Princeton. Went to Princeton. What did your parents say? You come home right. from winter break at Princeton and you're like, I'm gonna be an actor. Yeah. They say what? They were like, how great, Mark. This is why we spent $80,000 on a great school for your resume so it can have no merit or value whatsoever. You're throwing it all away. Great. But in fact, that, though they felt that way, in truth, they never said that to me. They were incredibly um, generous and supportive. And I think, but finally, when I was on a few sitcoms in the 90s, they were, they were, they got okay with it, as uh, you know. I had some legitimate career happening, but it was hard for a while. I imagine the industry. I mean, I guess we've all heard that that acting is a really tough business. People hear no all the time. I mean, even at the beginning of this interview, you said that you had looked at making Larry Gay, but it wasn't until you had had some success with Royal Pains that you thought to yourself, "Okay, I think I can actually do this." How do you persevere? 
through the auditions that you don't get or um, getting your scenes cut from movies because I was looking you up and you had a yes, few of those. I'm like, I he did. wasn't in that. I'm and so then you glad find we're his talking about that scenes today. Were cut from the movie. I want to, how did you this know? This is real stuff that real actors might give up their dream because they have to face and even successful, successful ones face them. Um, it's very hard. I, I would never pretend it's not. It's something you have to love. Uh, otherwise, it's not worth all the rejection and heartache. I mean, ev every time you go into an audition, you want that part. It's going to change your life. Every time you act in front of a camera, you want it to be the best it can be. I mean, I don't think I've ever phoned it in, whatever that means, because of something inside of us actors who have some desperate or deep need to uh, inhabit these characters that we get to play and tell stories about great characters. Um, so it was that drive to, to succeed and to be an actor who works and to tell stories that allowed me to overcome all that horrible rejection and those horrible conversations, like when a director calls and says, so you know that movie we shot for two and a half months in New York and Brooklyn and with, you know, you're not actually gonna end up in it. <laughs> That's not fun. You still get paid though, right? Yeah, you still get paid. Well, at least that softens the blow a it little does. bit. It, it does, but you'd be surprised how little that factors in because it's so much more about um, whether it's telling the stories or being seen it's somewhere in between the two you know getting to hone to do i mean you do your craft you put yourself on the line and then it's somewhere in the editing room they rejected you and that hurts that hurts me just hearing that yeah especially if it's what you love i, I mean my mother always said that to find what you love figure out what you would do for free and then figure out a way to get paid for it so even though you are getting the paycheck which does soften the blow it's gonna kind of yeah break your heart but a joseph bit. campbell in, advised us all to follow our bliss, and and I'm very lucky and fortunate that I was able to. Were you more critical of yourself with this film because you had so much skin in the game with producing? Yes, I was very critical with myself. Um, it was hard. I mean, it's hard to show up to a set with little money and uh, everyone's kind of uh, guerrilla filmmaking at its finest. And uh, Sam is a first time director who I knew very well. We had made rap videos and web series together, uh, but never a movie. And so we were all kind of green and it was a crew I didn't know that well. And every day you're showing up to be ridiculously funny as best you can. And there's much more going on than just people sitting around laughing. It's, we gotta get this scene in the next hour before moving on to the next location. There's a lot of pressure to, to have it all come together. And at the end of the week, I remember like really being self-conscious and talking to my manager and, and my wife and having moments of great doubt. But then you show up on Monday and you try to do it again. That's all you can do. do and it, it was a dream come true, but there was a line in an episode of Royal Pains, I actually, oddly enough, um, where a volleyball player says, or I say to her, but now that you got what you wanted, you're afraid you can't deliver the goods. And that's a little bit what I was feeling. Do you think you surprised any of your co-stars with your ability to, and I'm not exactly sure how to phrase this, I think any of us who are you know, fans of comedy um, can tell when someone is funny, just in general. I mean, obviously you have a ton of personality, you're really funny, we've seen you in things where you've been funny, but you were willing to maybe sacrifice or go further than someone else would to get the joke. And that's what really funny people do. Do you think you surprised your co-stars when you walked in there and were willing to go balls to the wall to get the joke? You know, I, I don't think I surprised them so much as maybe it was a, a delight to see that they were showing up to a set where everything was game, that, that I was game and, and everything was allowed on this set. And I remember a scene with Jayma Mays where we kiss for the first time 
and it started very tamely with a nice romantic kiss, and then it ended with the one that's in the movie, which is with my enormous, bulbous, turgid tongue filling her mouth and cleaning her entire face. I warn you, it ain't pretty. It ain't pretty. Uh, my wife but was it's not funny. thrilled with that particular scene. <laughs> Uh, not because she was paranoid, just because she felt bad, bad for Jayma Mays. Uh, but we were willing to go to a ridiculous place. And, and people like Danny Pudi and Jayma Mays, they were right there with me and topped me on many occasions. There's another one of those kisses in there. And believe me, you just have to watch the movie. But you'll be surprised and grossed out all while you're laughing. I want to turn it over to some q and I feel like we've, we know you guys already. Hello. Hi. Oh, hello. Y you two have been adorable in the middle, <laughs> smiling. You. And the one who's had, you know. Hey, some, hey, hey. Sorry. Don't make it creepy. We're not going to out What that. is your question? But you go, girl. Okay, sorry. Okay, I have two questions. Okay. Yes. Okay, so what made you want to start um, acting? What made well, me want to start decide? acting? That's a very big question. I mean, I think acting, you know, uh, this, this director I worked with, Ed Zwick, who directed this movie Defiance that I did, he talked about in, in a New York Times editorial that he once wrote, he talked about the void some void that is in all of us creative types that is filled by the anonymous mass of strangers that watch these things that we make. And I think there is something to that. There is some little part that might be a little broken or a little needy or just hungry in some way to express the things that we get to express. And it was in me. And I only discovered it when I was in college and started acting and felt that need fulfilled by the experience of being on stage. I mean, I was an athlete, so I had had that feeling of performance, but this was a new kind where it wasn't about just pinning the guy in wrestling or you know, scoring a touchdown in football, which were the sports that I played. It was about sharing your own private experience and doing it publicly. And something about that satisfied something in me. Um, hi. 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 <laughs> um, do you enjoy fatherhood and how old are your children? What a nice question. I love fatherhood. It is the thing I identify myself as most beyond being an actor now that I have these Three beautiful children. Uh, Lila is about to be nine years old. Frisco is seven years old. And Addie is five and a half. And they are the loves of my life. Um, as, as we were talking about how being an actor, you can face rejection and heartache. Um, there was never a salve, a comfort of any kind when I was doing it for the first 10 to 12 years of my career. But now I have this family that I get to come home to and forget about all my worries and worry about their worries and hold them and nurture them. And I don't have to think about myself anymore. I can worry about these three beautiful creatures and shaping their minds and their hearts. Um, but sometimes you even get to share in it with them because I remember when I first got Royal Pains, Lila was two years old or one and a half. I was in... Plummer Park in LA and I got the call that I got the part of Dr. Hank Lawson. And I remember just grabbing her and running in a circle like 10 times around and screaming at the top of my lungs because I was so happy. And so you get to share those moments too. But I love being a father um, and I love my children. Do they know what you do? Do they have an idea, maybe your oldest? Yeah, they have a sense. I mean, I tell, you know, they've been on set of, of Royal Pains. They knew that I was making Larry Gay when we were shooting it in LA. They listened to me rehearsing the musical number. So, you know, my, my son was singing along with me. He's Larry Gay, can he show you to his seat? Uh, Dad, you're the hottest thing at 30,000 feet. Um, but beyond that, you know, they have a sense like, They'll say, Daddy, you're famous, because some person comes up to me in the airport. But beyond that, those little moments, they are not taken with Hollywood or movies or music or pop culture at all yet, which I am completely fine with. Um, I'm just their dad. It'll all change when Frozen 2 comes yes. out. They'll be very, very taken you're with so that. You're so right.
When did you want to make the movie? When did I want to make the movie? Is that what he asked? Yeah. Um, it was probably uh, two and a half years ago, three years ago, that I started raising the money for this movie. Um, and as I told you, it was a long process. And each part of the process is a nail biter. You don't know if you're gonna, I mean, we, we had $500,000 and an airplane to shoot on in New York, and it all fell through with uh, a guy who owns sound stages in Brooklyn near where we shoot Royal Pains, and it just didn't come together. The money didn't show up, and so we suddenly had to scramble and find the money somewhere else. Uh, and these are the things that happen. Uh, while we were shooting in LA, uh, we had union issues that really affected production. We had to shut down for a day and it cost us about sixty, seventy thousand dollars of a of a budget where that was a significant amount, a big percentage of our entire budget. Um, I'm telling this to a nine-year-old. <laughs> you might have lost him at union issues. Yeah, what am I, I'm, sorry. I think two and a half years ago, probably. Would have... He asked when? Yeah. Okay, two and a half years ago. Sorry. It was Sorry. a good question. You ask good questions. I thought other cause... people might have been interested to hear. You know, Caitlin? I'm interested to hear. Tell me more about the union issues. I mean, you ask me how tall I am. I'm going to talk to you about Kanye West for a while. So, <laughs> See, he knew what know. was up. A two-parting What's question. Up? <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm a musical theater performer and trying to act and do things of that sort. Um, do you have any um, pearls of wisdom? I know you have probably a million, but, like, you know, your um, top couple um, first of all, good for you. Good luck to you. Um, my words of wisdom, uh, I have two. One is one that someone who didn't really want to help me out that much told me, which is no one is in the Mark Feuerstein business like Mark Feuerstein, um, which is just to remind you that no one's going to be as passionate about your development as a performer, your career as you are. Uh, and the other thing I would say is that you should try to write, try to direct, try to make a short, you know, like they learn how to do here at the Apple Store. Um, because there are so many, there's, there's so much access to great media today. You can go shoot a short tomorrow if you want to. Um, or mount a production of your favorite musical somewhere creative, uh, because it's so hard sitting around waiting for the phone to ring. It's such a feeling of powerlessness that anything you can do to act against that and take your fate into your own hands, I'm all for it. And that's why this movie came together, because I said, I'm not gonna sit around and wait for Hollywood to hand me uh, a studio comedy where I'm the lead, because I would be waiting till I'm in the actor's home drooling on myself. So I just did it, you know? And, and, uh, and that's, you know, for me, why this movie is kind of a triumph of the spirit uh, for, you know, for whatever it may be to people, and I hope it does well. To me, it, it proves that I can do it if I put my mind to it, and with the help of the resources I was able to acquire. Thank you. Um, you said it took 10 to 12 years until you had a kid. Um, actually, well, not, nine. Act She's nine years old. Okay. But, but I, had been, I had been acting for yeah, I was about to ask you, how 10 long to have 12 you been years before that. OK. So how long have you been acting overall? Say about 20 years. I mean, I, I graduated from drama school in 94. I was in London, came to New York acted for three years doing bit parts in off, 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 off Broadway plays, got parts in regional plays in, in uh, Hartford, Connecticut and in San Francisco. And I, was, I would drive down to LA in a rented car and meet whoever would meet me with the help of my representatives at the time. And I went in for a room of producers of a sitcom called Fired Up and I got the part as a regular on a sitcom in like 1996, and that's when my TV career and movie career began. 
Perseverance, man. That is what it takes. And now look where you are. Thank you, Hanging Caitlin. out with me. Yes. I want to thank you guys so much for your amazing questions and for hanging out with us. Um, I encourage you all to please check out Larry Gay, Renegade Male Flight Attendant. It is in select theaters, but you can also watch it on VOD and on demand. And, and can, can starring I just and produced say, by Mark can, can, thank you, Caitlin. I just want to say thank you to Caitlin Becker. Thank you. Who a few days ago was interviewing me on HuffPo Live, yeah. and she kindly agreed in her spare time to come moderate and interview with me today, and I just really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Mark. And being here today, really. I and really thank you, Mark, for doing everything.